friends of Jesus Christ. I'd like to begin with a song I heard on YouTube entitled, What Was I Made For? It's from the movie, Barbie. I haven't, I haven't seen the movie, but I did listen to the song, and I'm going to share it with you just in case you've missed it. Listen. What was I made for? I used to know, but I'm not sure now. What was I made for? What was I made for? Because I don't know how to feel, but I want to try. I don't know how to feel, but someday I might. Don't ask Ken. It's not what he was made for. I think I forgot how to be happy, something I'm not, but something I can be, something I wait for, something I'm made for, something I'm made for. So tell me what I was made for so that I can be happy. Now, i got to tell you, when I heard that, I thought that is a question that not only grips Barbie's heart, it grips everyone's heart. If not all the time, lots of time. What were we made for? And then I thought, well, we might not want to ask Ken, but, but we, could, we could ask the Westminster Confession. Because, as you know, its very first question is, basically, what are we made for? What is our chief end as human beings? And then it says, we're made for this, to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. That's what we're made for. But, of course, that, that needs a little further explanation. And so I thought, well, maybe the psalmist and the Apostle Paul could help flesh that out. What we are made for. And if you go to the psalm, Psalm 39, and that brief passage from it, you'll, you'll see that one of the things that, that psalmist obviously underscores is that whatever we're made for, we better find out fast because there's a brevity to our life. In fact, he says something like, you have made me, made my days a few breath, and, and my lifetime is as nothing in your sight. We might add that in comparison with the age of the universe, our time here could be counted in seconds. Our time is brief. And, and this is not to become neurotic, but it is important not to deny that we are all going to die. That there is a limited number of years to our lives. So, so that we don't think we have all the time in the world to get straight what it is we're made for. Now, if you were to read the psalm, it's, it's a very depressing psalm, a strange psalm, one of the commentators says, because he not only sees the brevity of life, he also sees that there is much sorrow. He, he talks about the fact that there is... There is uh, sadness and, and misery, the, the, the transiency of life. You're young, you have friends, you grow old, you lose friends, there, there are wars, there are earthquakes, there are reasons for sorrow and grief. It's not at all guaranteed that you have reasons to be happy when you are in the midst of a world with so much sadness. As, at least 
The psalmist thinks that. And I was thinking, in, in, in our case, just personally, if you take your family, maybe not your immediate family, but if you took your extended family, every one of us would have reasons to say, there are things that shadow over my life, casts a shadow over it. There are things that bring sadness to me. I am sometimes haunted every day by the thought of this or that that's happened. What were we made for? And the psalmist says, our days are brief, and you need to learn as soon as you can what it is that you are made for. So then when you go to the Apostle Paul, he's of course a great deal lengthier than the psalmist, and he has some very helpful things to say, something that, that, that will stagger us, I think, if, if, if we hear it right. He, he's, of course, terribly dis- disappointed with some of the members in the Corinthian church because they, as far as he's concerned, they are denying what is central to the gospel. They're taking the foundations right from underneath it. And then he has that that beginning, he says, you know, I handed out to you, I gave to you what I had received, which was of first importance. You know, he begins uh, in in chapter 2 with saying, I came to you knowing nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. But but now he adds to this, to, to that, the fact that this one who was crucified died was buried, and was raised again. And that he appeared to Cephas, and then uh, to the apostles, and and then to 500 uh, friends of Jesus Christ. And and most of them are still living, though some have died. And and then he appeared to uh, James, and, and to the 12, and then he says, he appeared to me as one untimely born. But, but he says, the testimony, my testimony has been that Jesus rose. And that through his resurrection, we have risen from death into life. So how can you say that there is no resurrection? The Apostle Paul has a sense or understanding of the resurrection that is of cosmic significance. Of cosmic significance. It's not only religiously significant, but cosmically significant. Religiously, he says, if you deny the resurrection of Christ, then everything that we've been saying is up for grabs, then, then, then it's all sham, then, 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 then believing or not believing makes no difference, but believing is ridiculous. And, and me going all over the Mediterranean world, it, it, it's a mistake. I mean, in, in that sense, how can you even, even think that there's no resurrection? But, but Paul, of course, understands what, what he continually preaches, namely that we have, in our baptism, shared a death like Christ's, and, and, and that with Christ's resurrection, we have shared a life like Christ's. And, and so it makes sense for Paul to say to the Philippians, for instance, that his life is all about living for Christ, and that dying would be gain. It would not be gain if Christ had not been risen. There would be no reason to have hope when your loved one dies if Christ has not been risen. But Christ has been risen. But now, it, it's, it's, you know, I, I worked with this for quite a while, and at first I was confused 
or confused, but I, I, I didn't quite understand what were Paul's main uh, complaint or argument was. It, it, it wasn't necessarily, I think, that the people in Corinth didn't believe that their spirits would, would, would maybe go, go, go to God. You know, that, that salvation was kind of an escape, an escape from the body. And, and, and so in, in the first 34 verses, Paul talks about death and those who have fallen asleep, meaning died. But, but then, beginning with verse 35, he, he starts talking about the body. And, and what becomes obvious is that there were those in the Corinthian church who did not believe in a bodily resurrection. And, and the reason for that, I, I think, is, is partly in, in, in the culture in which they were raised. In, in, in the Greek world, in the ancient world, the, the physical what was something, it was something that, that came about because because of chaos, because there, was, there were fights and battles between the gods. And, and the creation, it, 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 it was not seen as precious. Uh, the, the Corinthians didn't see our bodies as something precious to God. And, and of course, if, if you go with the scriptures, it, it says, oh, but the physical body means a great deal to God. This creation is precious to him. When he made it, he said it was good, very good. He created human beings, and they all have traces of God in them. They're image bearers. And so the, the attitude towards the world is, is, is different because because of the scriptures. We, 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 we understand and, and experience the sin and the dying and, and the suffering. It, it's true, we do all that, and we know and are familiar with all that, but we are also familiar with the fact that now and again, there are situations so saturated with mystery that we feel that we are in the presence of God. There is such beauty. This world of wonders holds our breath. I, I came across, well, well I, th I thought of two examples. One was, you know, remember the chariots, chariots of fire, where, where Eric Little, who is uh, training for a missionary position in China, but he's running for the Olympics and he's training, and his sister, who's very pious, says, God is not happy with you for doing this, this running. And then he says, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. When I run, I bring pleasure to God. When you love and worship and adore, you need to feel God's pleasure in this world. And you need to know that you give pleasure to God. There is a relationship to this creation, to God. Uh, I came this just recently by Eddie, Eddie Hillison. I don't, she's, a, she was, she's Jewish, a, a Dutch Jewish woman, non-practicing. And then in the 1940s, 1940, when, when Germany invaded Holland, uh, she went into hiding, and, 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 and then she, she tells of, of times where, where she was almost forced to go on to her knees and pray. And, and then here, here's what she wrote at one point. She says, it was as if the body had been meant and made for, kneel, for, for kneeling. Sometimes... What is all that noise? Okay. It was as if the body had been meant and made for kneeling. Sometimes in moments of deep gratitude, kneeling down 
became an overwhelming urge. Gratitude, astonishment, loving. These, these are all parts of, 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 this, of this world. And, and God intends to bring this world into a new creation. So now we get back to this business. See, this really seems strange. <laughs> so, okay, now, but someone will ask, how then are the dead raised? What kind of a body do they come? And, and then Paul says, and he's really, really rather harsh, fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body, but that is to be, the, the, the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps a wheat, or one of grain. This image, and, and I gotta get back here for a minute. Now, th this image of the seed and, and, and the body that we bury being like the seed and the resurrected body being like the plant it is to me an image that tells us that the transformation will be staggering. I mean, I have here, you, you, you can't see it, I know, it's an acorn. If you were to bury this, it could become an oak tree, 80 feet tall, with 100 feet spreads. You could look at this acorn till the day you die, and you would never, ever conclude what it was made for, what its potential was or is. Uh, the seed is the body and you do not sow the body but the seed to get what you want. Thinking about that, I, 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 I have a poem that I, I carry around with me in my uh, cell phone uh, by, by T.S. Eliot. It's, uh, it's called, and T.S. Eliot was a Christian, and, 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 and he writes, that the title is Wait Without Hope. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be light and the stillness, the dancing, whisper of running streams and winter lightning, the wild thyme, which is a low-growing plant used both for medicine and cooking, the wild thyme, unseen, and the wild strawberry, the laughter in the garden, 
lost, not lost, but requiring pointing to the agony of death and birth. What we are waiting for, what we are expecting, is, is beyond, beyond our imagining. All that is good in this world will be there, but how, how it all will work? I mean, I, you know, at my age now, you think about this quite a bit, and, and, and you don't understand it and don't find your way through it, but then you come to this and you say, it's like when I was seven months within my mother's womb and I had a conversation with her and I said, what is there beyond this or is this all there is? And she would say to me, Jack, there is no way you could understand what it means to be beyond that womb where you're quite comfortable and walk the streets of Swichem and fly in airplanes and climb mountains and fall in love and have friends. You'll just have to wait. Paul, Paul talks, then, then when, when he gets loose, he talks about the, the perishable taking on the imperishability and the mortal taking on immortality and, and, and that death itself has been ripped out of the universe and has been swallowed up and the sting of death, which is sin, which is separation, which is darkness, which is alienation, which is hate, all that has been taken up into Christ and has gone down into the, 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 into the abyss with Christ when he died on Calvary. We are a new creation. We are, we are preparing to live a life glorifying God and enjoying him forever. And then Paul, at the end of that ecstatic outburst, says, therefore, brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.